Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okie dokes. Hey guys, uh, Greekonian, I believe, uh, recommended this to me on Discord. Thank you. Greek War of Independence, how it started, early modern history, preemptive like, kings and generals, great channel. My name's Connor, if you're new, original link to the video, top of the description. Did I just say that twice? If I did, fine. Let's get started. Let's learn. In historiography, the Greek... Curious how far back this is In Western go. historiography, the Greek peoples are the proverbial titans of antiquity. Despite this, the modern Greek nation was born in the relatively recent 19th century, forged by revolutionaries who knew only Ottoman domination, and for whom Greece was merely an idea that had to be won in war. Welcome to our new series on the Greek War of Independence. In this first episode, we will explore the lives of Greek peoples during 500 years of Ottoman rule, before examining the lead-up to revolt and the first stages of the revolution that birthed modern Greece. We've also got a new weapon for you in the fight for online independence, sponsor? thanks to the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. Yeah, if the, any video I watch that has sponsors that interest you, please make sure to use their promo codes and links, guys. You probably know about using NordVPN to bypass regional restrictions and encrypt internet activity, but now they offer a new service called Threat Protection that can be used with or without the VPN. It deletes dangerous files that try to automatically download themselves or those hiding behind fake links before any damage can be done. It warns you when a site is potentially unsafe, a phishing scam, or is going to harvest your data. And similarly, it blocks web trackers that create data profiles specifically about you, enhancing your anonymity and privacy. Essentially, it rolls the functions of antivirus software into the NordVPN package. Just click a button in the corner of the Nord window and engage the new protections and they remain effective whether you're using a VPN or not. It's all included in the price, so if you have NordVPN, you can use it now. Or if not, we have an exclusive offer for our viewers. Get an extra month for free with a two-year NordVPN plan by going to nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. I made it. On the 29th of May, 1453, the great Mehmed. bombards of Sultan Mehmed II brought an end to a millennia-old Greek-speaking Eastern Roman Empire. Henceforth, the overwhelming majority of Greeks were subjects to the sultans of the House of Osman. I Hold on, sorry guys. I know I technically made it on time, but I just... On the 29th of May, 1453, the great bombards of Sultan Mehmed II brought an end to a millennia-old Greek-speaking Eastern Roman Empire. Henceforth, the overwhelming majority of Greeks were subjects to the sultans of the House of Osman. Under the Ottoman regime, Greeks were grouped into the Rum Millet, a self-governing religious community led by the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople, which included all other Orthodox Christian ethnicities in the empire. Despite this, Greek speakers maintained a distinct ethnic identity from their co-religionists, calling themselves, calling themselves Romii, Romans. Indeed, the concept of a Greek or Hellenic identity for the most part had not existed for centuries, and for early modern Greek speakers, the heroes of Homer were mystical giants from a distant pagan past, not their direct ancestors. For over a millennia, the Greek language had been firmly associated with Byzantine Christianity, so even under the Ottoman Empire, Greeks continued to be identified as Romans. Life for Christians under the Ottoman Empire was complex. On one hand, they were legally an inferior class to Muslims, often subject to arbitrary prohibitions, Taxes. such as on bearing arms and riding mounts, while their word counted for less than a Muslim's in most courts of law. Additionally, they were beholden to the infamous Deshirma system, in which Christian boys were forcibly taken from their homes and indoctrinated to become the Sultan's loyal slave soldiers. On the other hand, Ottoman Christians had relative religious freedom, while the ecumenical patriarchs of Constantinople became highly influential under Ottoman purview. Osmanli overlordship also saw a rise in Greek merchants and... It's, at first, it's like, okay... Okay, freedom of religion, sort of. You get to practice your religion. But your word isn't worth as much as a Muslim's in court. 
but we can take your kid and make him into a slave soldier. It's like, oh, well, this is getting worse and worse. Landowners. Osmanli overlordship also saw a rise in Greek merchants and landowners. By the 18th century, a group of Greek merchants named the Venariotes had emerged as among the wealthiest magnates in the entire Mediterranean. This even led to the Fenariotes being appointed to govern the territories of Moldavia and Wallachia on the Sultan's behalf. All of this might give the impression that Ottoman Greece was a thoroughly tamed land, which it certainly was not. Indeed, while the cities and plains were pacified, the mountains remained a hotbed of native insurgents known as clefts, who generally devoted their lives to banditry against... I don't know if you guys are like pausing to read this or not, but... I should start reading them out. So, cleft uh, comes from the same root as kleptomaniac, as the as the clefts had to steal from local villages to survive. The Greek dish kleftiko is also named after this group. Against the local Ottoman institutions. That's the problem, though, with pausing for th things like these, and I and I hate this because I can't listen and read at the same time, and I hate having to pause the video each time a little thing like this comes up. So I kind of like try to skim it quick and then like keep listening. The mountains remained a hotbed of native insurgents known as clefts, who generally devoted their lives to banditry against the local Ottoman institutions. In response, the Ottomans hired native collaborators known as Armatili to root out the clefts. However, loyalties were extremely precarious Yesterday's Amatili could become tomorrow's clefts, and vice versa. Another group that constantly defied Ottoman authority were the Maniots. Living in unconquerable coastal fortress villages of the titular Mani Peninsula, the Maniots habitually preyed on Ottoman ships, that is, when their many clans weren't engaged in mafia-like blood feuds against one another. Overall, the clefts, Armatili, and Maniots were little more than local banditos. However, their existence proved that Ottoman Greece always had people perpetually ready to resist the Ottoman yoke. But this would only snowball into open rebellion when the time was right. From the 18th century onwards, the Ottoman Empire was increasingly geopolitically contained by the growing global influence of European colonial empires. The most dangerous of these European powers Russia? was Imperial Russia. In 1768, Catherine the Great declared one of Russia's many wars on the Turks and emerged victorious, securing favorable terms in the 1774 Treaty of Kuchuk Kainaja, which included a provision that recognized the Russian Tsars as the symbolic protectors of all Orthodox Christians in Ottoman lands. The that's, that's connected to what the Crimean War was about, right? Also, if you look at modern-day Turkey, super well defended. I mean, I guess here would probably... I mean, you have the Caucasus Mountains, which, you know, good luck getting an army through that. And then, obviously, you have the Aegean, Black Sea, and then Mediterranean over here. And then, I mean, you got a... And I, I'm, I'm not sure how open this is here, uh, but, yeah. Super well protected. This led symbolic protectors of all Orthodox Christians in Ottoman lands. This led to increase Russian influence over Ottoman Greeks. Indeed, at the Congress of Vienna in 1815, as the great powers of Europe met to decide the fate of their continent after Napoleon's defeat, a young Russian ambassador in the service of Tsar Alexander I proved to be one of the single most influential men in carving out the New World Order. His name was Ioannis Kapodistrias, an ethnic Greek, and while not immediately relevant to our story right now, he will become exceedingly important later, so... Do you think if Napoleon was successful in taking down Russia, he would have then finished off what he kind of started when he was in Egypt? Or, or do you think he would have gone after the, the Ottoman Empire afterwards? Anyone? Remembered to our story right now, he will become exceedingly important later, so remember his name. Okay. Meanwhile, the Imperial Russian port town of Odessa was home to one of the few thriving Greek communities outside the Ottoman Empire. It was there, in 1814, that the Feliki Eterea was formed. 
The Aeterea was a secret society that sought to cultivate a new patriotic ethnogenesis for the modern Greek people by promoting Hellenism, reviving their long dormant ties to the ancient Spartans and Athenians, while doing away with the Roman label which had long become associated with Ottoman servitude. But it is incredible about uh, Greece and, and Italy's uh, you know, creation in, in the 1800s is that they're separated by so much time from the sort of antiquity roots, ancient roots, so many centuries, and yet they're still able to kind of form their identity and create the country somewhat based off of that, it seems. Felicia was more long become associated with Ottoman servitude. But Felicia was more than just a cultural society, for it was also actively dedicated to the military liberation of their homeland. In 1817, the society propositioned Capodistrias to be their leader, but the great diplomat refused. This gang of radicals, he concluded, would only lead Greece to ruin. Nevertheless, the Eteria soon became a vast Freemason organization with secret supporters all across Ottoman Greece. Agents within the influential Fenariotti merchant class gave the society vast economic and social reach, while initiates among the clefts and maniots provided the society with a military backbone. In 1820, Veliki Eteria came under the leadership of one Alexander Ypsilantis, a wealthy aristocrat of Fenariot stock. Immediately, Ypsilantis concluded that now was the time to initiate open revolt. The Ottomans were distracted. The elderly Albanian governor of Epirus was rebelling against the reigning Sultan Mahmud II, who was doubly distracted dealing with escalating border tensions with Persia. Initially, Ypsilantis meticulously drew out detailed war plans, which were to be carefully orchestrated in the spring of 1821. But just after New Year's, a Feliki agent was captured by Ottoman officials while in possession of some compromising documents. Meanwhile, the Fenariot Prince of Wallachia, Michael Soutsos, had been hedging his bets. While officially a member of the Aeteria, he had also secretly sent correspondence to the Sultan informing him of the society's plans. Secrecy was out the window. The revolution had to begin now. Ironically, the first major campaign of the Greek War of Independence began in Romania, for Greek Fenariot ties ran deep there. On February 22, 1821, Ypsilandis crossed the Pruth River into Ottoman Wallachia at the head of a platoon of Greek volunteers he dubbed the Sacred Band, an allusion to the Theban hoplites of antiquity. However, the Wallachian campaign was mired with problems from the start. Ypsilandis continuously motivated his supporters by promising Russian aid, which was never coming, was perpetually short on funds to pay his troops, and had a deeply dysfunctional relationship with the local Romanians. Ultimately, Ypsilandis and his sacred band would be crushed by an Ottoman cavalry force at the Battle of Dragosheni on June 19, 1820. Uh, fled to Austria where he would be imprisoned by Habsburg authorities who, guided by Chancellor Kem Clemens von Metternich, um, saw all revolutionaries as a threat to the monarchical, monarchical status quo of Europe. Metternich is fascinating. Um, I watched a video. I didn't react to it, but I just watched a video on my own time. Um... A week ago, Romanians. Ultimately, Ypsilandis and his sacred band would be crushed by an Ottoman cavalry force at the Battle of Dragosheni on June 19, 1821. The Greek Revolution had seemingly stumbled out of the gate, but while the northern expedition had failed, rebellious tensions in Greece proper had boiled over. Back on March 25th, at the monastery of Achia Lavra, Canadios, Archbishop of Patras, raised the Christian banner of revolt, declaring a national uprising. The battle for Greece had begun. In 1821, the Greeks had no regular army. Most revolutionaries had almost no combat experience, as under Ottoman rule, Christians had been largely forbidden to bear arms. Those who were battle-hardened, namely the Maniots, Clefts, and Armatolis, were mostly accustomed to irregular warfare. Moreover, the rebels had little internal cohesion, with different cells of insurrectionists each doing their own thing, without any real central authority to guide them. 
Nevertheless, a cabal of charismatic commanders ensured that good leadership carried the Greek cause. Be they Maniot sea lords like Petros Mavromichalis, cleft bandit chiefs like Theodoros Kolokotronis, or Phanariot aristocrats like Demetrios Ypsilandis, the younger brother of Alexander, who was in an Austrian prison. These men of drastically different social class and background led an unlikely band of insurrectionists in the name of a common cause. With that said, revolutionary leaders still clashed with one another as much as they did with the Ottomans over issues of ideology, influence or shared plunder. Nevertheless, within just a week, virtually the entire Morea fell into Greek hands, save for the cities of Patras and Tripolitsa and some walled fortresses. Control over the Peloponnesian countryside was further secured when a 3,000-strong revolutionary force under former cleft bandit lord Theodoros Kolokotronis defeated an Ottoman force nearly twice its size at the Battle of Valtetsi on May 24th. Things were going comparatively worse in central Greece, where the capable Ottoman Albanian general Omavrioni won a victory against a promising young revolutionary commander, Athanasios Diakos, who he had executed by impalement. However, Vrioni's army was contained by the heroics of one. According to legend, he was offered uh, a chance to defect and become an officer in his army, to which Diakos. Uh, Diakos replied, I was born a Greek and I will die a Greek. Odysseus Andrutsos, who, while outnumbered 120 to 8,000, defeated the Holy Ottomans mustache. at the Battle of... I want to grow... I can't. Vrioni's army was contained by the heroics of one Odysseus Andrutsos, who, while outnumbered 120 to 8,000, defeated the Ottomans at the Battle of Gravia Inn, while losing only six of his own men. Ultimately, this allowed the revolutionaries to secure a tenuous hold on central Greece. In 1821, the Ottoman state was ill-prepared to deal with the Greek revolt. For one thing, the imperial army was in the midst of an identity crisis. Former Sultan Selim III had attempted to modernize his forces on a Western European model, but this had gotten him deposed by the Janissaries in 1806, who in the century since their formation had mutated from their original role as an elite corps of loyal slave soldiers into an armed special interests group, scheming against any Sultan who threatened their position of privilege. I'd love to learn more about that story. How? What? That'd be a good video in itself. Group, scheming against any sultan who threatened their position of privilege. In addition to this, the empire had become increasingly decentralized. Since the 17th century, vast swaths of land had fallen under the control of the Ayans, provincial notables, most of whom acted as de facto autonomous overlords of quasi-independent fiefs. Indeed, when the Greeks raised the banner of revolt, the majority of Ottoman troops had been tied up, putting down the apostasy of Ali Pasha, the 80-year-old Albanian Ayan, to the immediate north. The declining effectiveness of the Ottoman army and the inability of the Sultan to rally his most powerful vassals were both general factors that led to their inability to quell the Greek revolt. My God, the Ottoman Empire is just a mess, huh? Like, it, it's a lot of areas controlled by a bunch of, even in Anatolia, right, which is the main kind of, what, modern-day Turkey part, right? Just controlled by a bunch of different people that, uh, that has said the Sultan doesn't have much control over, and then the people fighting over here were dubious with their uh, loyalties. Jeez, uh, okay. Both general facts. Uh, the, not a well-run machine. I'll say that. Is ...that led to their inability to quell the Greek revolt. While most of the Peloponnese and central Greece was secured, a cast of hardy islanders fought a fierce naval war upon the shimmering seas of the Aegean. In 1821, the Ottoman navy was a juggernaut of modern warships. Did, Ottomans, did they have boats like this? Ships like Centralized this? leadership of the Kapitan Pasha, Grand Admiral of the Empire, in contrast, the Greeks had only an improvised fleet of lightly armed merchant ships. Nevertheless, they knew the capricious currents of the Aegean better than anyone, so home field advantage was on their side. 
at the onset of the war, the Greek revolutionary fleet was outfitted principally by merchant shipowners from the islands of Hydra, Spetses, and Sara. Despite lacking in heavy weaponry or centralized leadership, the makeshift Greek flotilla was able to find quick success against the Ottomans. More often than not, the gulf in firepower was overcome through the use of fire ships. On the 27th of May, the Sariot Corsair Dimitrios Papanikolis incinerated an Ottoman two-decker frigate off the coast of Eresos, the first of many infernos that would define the revolutionary war at sea. Greek maritime success was crucial, as it prevented the Ottomans from landing reinforcements in mainland Greece, isolating the remaining imperial garrisons there, and contributing to the fall of Ottoman-controlled cities. As the revolt raged on, things got very ugly very quickly. Throughout the empire, Greek civilians were indiscriminately slaughtered, particularly in the capital, where armed janissaries roamed the streets, killing Christians in cold blood. On April 10th, ecumenical patriarch Gregory V, the temporal leader of Orthodox Christianity, was suddenly arrested, sentenced to death by the Sultan, and hanged. Is Russia going to get Ironically, into this? prior to his execution, Gregory had condemned the revolution, and his unceremonious death shocked the Christian world. In Russia, Capodistrias wrote passionate letters condemning the Sultan. But despite this, no aid from Russia. Guided by Metronics doctrine, the great powers of Europe emphatically distanced themselves from anything resembling anti-monarchist rebellion. Really? Wait, what? Then, then why even... Wait. So why even say you're going to be the protector of Christians if no matter what the Ottomans do to Christians in their territory that you say you're the protector of, you're just going to be like, well, it's a monarchy. I don't want to, you know, that doesn't make any sense. All the West came. Meanwhile, revolutionary hands were hardly clean either, and Greek rebels committed numerous exterminations against Muslim civilians. On September 23rd, the city of Tripolitsa fell to the forces of Kolokotronis, and 8,000 Muslim and Jewish civilians within its walls were butchered. Both Greek and Ottoman forces would continue to perpetrate mass slaughters as the war went on. In the first what did the Jewish people do? What? Civilians within its walls were butchtronis, and 8,000 Muslim and Jewish civilians. Man, Jewish people just cannot catch a break. <laughs> just no matter what, it's like, okay, well, you know, I've... Within its walls were butchered. Both Greek and Ottoman forces would continue to perpetrate mass slaughters as the war went on. In the first year of the rebellion, there was little to no central authority governing the Greeks, as different regions operated under their own independent military leaders and regional governing councils. However, as the permanence of independence set in, it became necessary to establish the proper pillars of government that would define the new Greek nation. In December of 1821, revolutionary leaders of every region of Greece, be they landowners, merchants, intellectuals, warlords, or arch priests, gathered at the town of Piada. The architect of this grand conclave was one Alexandros Mavrokodatos, a young intellectual of aristocratic Fenariot stock. Educated in Switzerland and Italy, and reputedly able to speak ten languages, Mavrokodatos was a purebred product of the European Enlightenment. As a result, rugged warlords like Kolokotronis hated his guts. <laughs> to them, Mavrokodatos was little more than a milksop pen pusher. And due to his preference milksop. towards Western European clothing, a borderline foreigner. Nevertheless, even the most rough hewn of clefts saw the necessity of Greek unity, and so gathered at Pieda under Mavrokodatos' auspices. For the next month, various chieftains and regional strongmen quarreled incessantly. I just say, Greece is fascinating. You you have a a a um alphabet that I believe you guys are the only ones to use. You have an incredible ancient history, and you you just you're. I feel like if if anyone can sort of be proud of a country. It, it, I think Greeks might, just because you're so sort of unique, 
and I mean unique, meaning like one of a kind. It's like, oh, we don't like them, but we don't like you, and then you're not afraid to fight. Man, Greece is something else. But in month, various chieftains and regional strongmen quarreled incessantly. But in the end, the contours of nationhood began to form. A national constitution was written, and a provisional government was established, divided into a legislative and executive branch, presiding over eight federal ministries. Mavrokodatos would, of course, serve as the president of the executive, making him the de facto leader of this new administration. Hold up, sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. But in the end, the contours of nationhood began to form. A national This government was molded on the constitutional models of the American and French revolutions. No constitution was written, and a provisional government was established, divided into a legislative and executive branch, presiding over eight federal ministries. Mavrokodatos would, of course, serve as the president of the executive, making him the de facto leader of this new administration. On the 15th of January 1822, the National Assembly of the Natal Greek Nation collectively signed an official declaration of independence from the Ottoman Empire. The war we are waging against the Turks, far from being founded in demagoguery, seditiousness, or the selfish interest of any one part of the Greek nation, is a national and holy war, the object of which is to reconquer our rights to individual liberty, property, and honor. The dawn of the new year had heralded the dawn of a new nation. The first Hellenic Republic had been born. Despite a new constitution binding them, the rivalries between the Greek revolutionaries would soon stretch to their breaking point, resulting in a series of civil wars at the worst possible time. For, on the other end of the Mediterranean, an invading armada of the invincible governor of Egypt threatened to smother the idea of free Greece in its crib. Our series on the Greek War of Independence will continue, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. So it this helps is just immensely. the beginning. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members. Great videos always from Kings and Generals. Greece is just a badass country with an amazing history. And uh, if there's more to this, which I think there is, I, I'd be glad to watch those as well. So fascinating. Love you all. Hope you guys are all doing well. Would appreciate any comments down below, any answers to my questions or any comments at all. Hope you guys are doing well, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.